I think they were. Well, we'll start because we are at full capacity. So thank you so much for being here, for staying on the line outside. Uh, it's a lovely day. I have a rock star panel here with me. I'll start uh, by introducing myself. I'm Mark Cirillo. I've been with CINT for 20 years, always thinking about what the new technologies will bring, always passionate about machine learning. Uh, and today, uh, I'm the head of the machine learning group at CINT. Uh, before I, I let them introduce themselves, quick poll here. How much of you have seen uh, freestyle machine? Keep your hands yeah. up if you have drank, drank from, uh, from it. Perfect. So I have to say that it's, it's a testimonial. Like every time, every time I try it, I remember of my childhood when I had those bottled Coca Colas. So it's it's really great taste. It's like that movie uh, Ratatouille when the guy, the critic, drinks it and then it's transported uh, to the past. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> so I'll let you guys introduce your, your, yourself. So Michael. Sure, I'm Michael Connor, and uh, I was director of AI for Coca-Cola, and now I'm leading the, the uh, software team for Freestyle. Right, I, I'm Thomas Stubbs. Uh, Connor and I went to see Elon Musk yesterday, so we're not feeling quite like rock stars having <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. watched Elon come out and do a little jig on, on stage. Um, yeah. yeah, we should have choreographed a dance, mm. honestly. Uh, I'm Thomas Stubbs. I'm VP of Engineering and Innovation for Freestyle. Uh, and uh, I've been at Coca-Cola for 13 years, and prior to that, it was all startups all the time. I'm Tiziana Costa. I'm a business director of CINT, and I have been working with Coca-Cola and, and Thomas and Michael here for five years now. So deeply embedded in their <laughs> yeah. world. <laughs> awesome. So many of you have never seen a freestyle machine. Uh, so I'll give the panel the opportunity to talk about what is the freestyle machine and why it has become so important for Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, freestyle began in a basement uh, at Coca-Cola 10 years ago. Uh, we, we think about it in some ways by uh, its age as being approximately the age uh, of the iPhone when it was released uh, seven, eight years ago. And, um, and as, we, uh, as we innovate along, we, of course, like to, to, to watch what's going on with the iPhone and, uh, and Apple, and there have been a lot of changes. And we'll talk about uh, some of the changes that, uh, that we're making uh, on the innovation front uh, during the course of this panel. But it got started in a basement with uh, a chairman who really believed uh, in the idea of taking what had been uh, a hundred-year-old technology, which was the, the classic soda fountain, where you had um, uh, soda water, the ingredients, and the, you know, and the soda jerk uh, pouring, and expanding that idea so that uh, we could have um, many, many um, flavors and, and choices uh, on, uh, on a single machine. And we had to invent uh, a lot of technology along the way in order to do it and borrow some technology from other industries. Um, but after several years of, uh, of, of R&D, uh, we went into our, our first outlet. And it's just uh, grown uh, ever since, um, mainly because it's really, really popular um, with, with consumers and, and, and customers. And it's important for Coca-Cola, the second part of the question, because it allows us to introduce uh, a lot of new choices and, and flavors uh, in the outlets where it is. If you, if you consider the, the soda fountain, it used to be you know, one flavor. You could get Coke at the pharmacy with your grilled cheese sandwich, which was pretty great and still pretty great if you can mm -hmm. find a pharmacy that will serve you a grilled cheese sandwich <laughs> and, a, and, a, and, a, and a soda Coke. Um, but if you go into uh, a place without freestyle, do you, how, how many choices do you have? Anybody want to hazard a guess? You can shout it out. Seven. That's about right. I mean, there's six on the soda fountain, and then you'll normally have a tea and coffee and maybe a juice, uh, but that's it. Um, Freestyle uh, has about 170 uh, choices. And so in marketing terms, those of you that read that book long ago about long-tail marketing, it, it's, a, it's a long-tail machine. You know, it has 170-odd choices, and uh, about 50% uh, of those are low or no-calorie um, and uh, uh, and we, we even found that people uh, discover new 
uh, new flavors and, and, and brands on the freestyle machine and then go off and, and buy those at, uh, at their local grocery store. So um, it's important to us for, for lots of reasons, but uh, uh, those are some of the highlights. Okay. And you mentioned that uh, you imported some technology from other industries. Uh, is there science fiction-like type of uh, technologies there? They are science fiction-like. Uh, the, the, uh, the level of, of concentration of ingredients is uh, over 100 uh, to 1 for those of you that know something about chemistry or, or, or physics. So really, really highly concentrated. Uh, the, the technology uh, was, was co-developed uh, with um, the, the medical industry. Uh, there is um, uh, an inventor that many of you will, uh, will know about named Dean Kamen, who um, invented the Segway. Well, he's famous for inventing the Segway, but he actually, that's the least important thing he ever invented. <laughs> uh, he invented uh, pumps uh, and technology for home dialysis uh, and for cancer delivery. He also, uh, with Coca-Cola, uh, invented uh, technology for water purification that can be uh, a standalone in villages or places that otherwise wouldn't have clean water. And he helped us develop the, the microdosing technology, the, the, the pumps that allow us uh, very precise ratios as we're, as we're making a drink. Uh, and, and by the way, we make these drinks in real time. So if you can imagine, uh, the, the code name of the project actually was JET when it was being developed. And the reason for that uh, is as the water or carbonated water is coming through the nozzle, the ingredients to make the drink are mixed in that stream in, in, in real time. So it is, it, it is the freshest possible uh, drink you can get because it's, it's, it's made right, right there and then uh, to spec. And it uses uh, that technology from uh, that ad adjacent industry. There's the explanation why I'm transported to my childhood. Like maybe it's the pureness. Are you talking about uh, carbonated water? Let's welcome Topo Chico to the Total Beverage Company, Coca-Cola. So I love Topo Chico. We have one, one fan in the back there. <laughs> <laughs> Two then. <laughs> so absolutely, when you have 140 different types of uh, uh, flavors uh, and you have a machine that people are touching all the time, you have like production of huge amount of data, right? And you are the software guy. I remember a talk back in 2014 when you said, uh, that was a very interesting parallel. You said, oh, the, the biggest challenge inside a big company is the formation of data cartels. That is, the groups inside companies that are protecting their data instead of sharing their data for the, for the good of the business. So can you tell the audience, maybe most of you haven't seen that video. It's on YouTube, by the way. Uh, where, you know, can you, tell, can you tell us more about the challenges of the data cartels? Maybe what is the, exactly the data cartel and you know, how yeah, far sure, yeah. you've come. It was then. a few years ago and uh, we had a brand that was having some trouble. And so we launched this data science effort internally to, to figure out what was going on. And, um, and it was successful. We figured out what was happening, but it was very expensive. It took us a long time to get there. And so we looked back and said, well, what happened? Why was that so difficult to, to figure that out? And what we found that like 10% of the time was actually spent doing data science work. And then about 90% of the time was spent going door to door, talking to people that own the systems, that own the data that we need, and, um, and try to pry it away from them. And so I think people inside the company don't see data as belonging to the company. They see it as, um, you know, as something that they own and control. And, um, and so we kind of internally started calling these guys the data cartels. And, and so uh, we realized that culture change was a big part of what we needed to do. And so Coke being a you know, marketing company, we started talking about the data democracy and, and freedom of data and, and things like that. And, that. and that definitely helped. And so one of the things we're realizing with, with data science and especially AI, um, it's very data hungry, yeah. es especially AI. So like, let's take the, uh, the example of some of the, the AI you've seen in images. So you can feed uh, AI a picture of a cat and, um, and it will tell you this is a cat sitting in a window. And uh, the AI is actually very simple. I mean, you can do this with, 50 lines of code, there's libraries available, it's trivial to implement. Um, but, but what people don't realize a lot of time is you have to send in like 250,000 pictures of cats, 250,000 pictures of uh, images without cats, no um, and things like that. So it's like a huge amount of work to actually train and, and, and feed this stuff. And so um, the whole data democracy and, and the data lake became a lot more relevant, especially um, with AI going forward. And so, um, 
one of the things that one of the pitfalls I think um, that that we made, and I think a lot, of, I think this is common, is that we thought that a tool or a technology was going to solve our problems. And so a few years ago, people talk about Hadoop and the data lake, and that was the thing that was going to solve everybody's problems. It's easy to just write a check and say, we're doing the data lake, and, and, and this will be great. And so what we realized is that, that tools and technology don't solve problems, and AI won't either. Mm -hmm. um, it's ju it's just, a, just a way to help you solve a problem. You have to have the data. And so uh, it's, it's absolutely essential that companies have an enterprise data strategy and that executives start to see data as an asset, right? Just like your supply chain, your intellectual property. Um, it's something that has to be fed and nurtured and cared for. Um, and, and so I think we're starting to see that. 50% mm. of companies now have a chief data officer, um, although only 13% of those guys are tied to revenue. And so we're starting to see um, that happening. But uh, I think we have a, a decent, decent way to go before we get there. Do you have less of a data cartel collection inside Coca-Cola today after four years? Um, we definitely have less. It's, got, it's gotten a lot better. But uh, again, that initial rush to put everything in Hadoop into the data lake, what happens is it starts to, um, it starts to age out over time. Right? So the enterprise data strategy, you need things like, uh, and these are horribly boring things like watching paint dry. Right? You, you need like a metadata strategy, uh, data. Um, uh, you need uh, security and access, uh, data catalogs, all these different things. Actually, you know, people that have tried to do this in companies, it's, it's hard to get people to even read you know, the, the data strategy, right? This is not fun topics to talk about. And so um, I, think, I think AI will be limited until companies kind of get their whole data strategy figured out. And so I'm seeing this in, in companies where they're saying, like, hey, let's start kick off this data AI project, this AI project, and hoping that there'll be a solution. Um, and, and I think it distracts everybody from the real problem, which is the underlying data strategy. Totally One of the cool things about Freestyle is we, we have, uh, we're, we're our own P&L in Coca-Cola, so we have access to all of our, uh, our own uh, data. And so we, we are really, really excited about the things that we're, we're, we're doing because we have access and we have the ability to, to, to build uh, taxonomies that are sort of on the, on the leading edge. Um, but uh, Coca-Cola has come a long way from that 10 to 90, uh, 90%. I don't know that we're at 50-50, and I'm not even sure. Uh, it would be really cool to be able to say that we had totally inverted that ratio, and we were spending 10% you know, of our time wrangling our data and 90% analyzing it. That's definitely not, not true. Uh, but as a, as a North Star, that's, uh, that would be a good place to be. Yeah, and it's not just internal company data. It's, it's Nielsen data, uh, yes. social data sentiment. There, you know, people used to think of the, um, the internal data only, yeah. but now it's more of an ecosystem of partners, Foursquare, wherever you can get data. Yeah, in the video in, on YouTube, he will talk about the, how you build a data lake. I, I strongly encourage you guys to take a look. So very interesting question from Slido. Uh, the information is here if you want to submit yours. Uh, 5805, I think, is the code. Uh, the, que but the question is about how you collect negative but constructive feedback about people who don't use the, this freestyle machine. But before that, let's talk about the, when you get uh, constructive feedback. I think, Tiziana, was, you were the first one to tell me to, to break the news that Coca-Cola had invented a new flavor based on the data from Freestyle. And then we get back to this question from the audience. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, when, when you're talking about identifying your consumers and, and, and uh, how to actually reach your consumers, we usually have, uh, if you use like the typical personas, you're t using age, race, uh, geography, and it's, it's uh, your generalization that's very inaccurate sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. When you have data like uh, from uh, pouring information all day long, you can actually find out much more specifics uh, uh, about uh, behavior, consumer behavior, and you can actually react to, to uh, similarities in consumer behavior instead of generalizations based on something as vague as race, age, right? So we are actually, regardless of who you actually are, we're talking about what you are actually doing, what are your preferences, regardless of any other aspects. Then you can find the similarities, identify the trends in behavior, and react to that, being much more specific, having a much more personalized relationship with people that are actually there pouring their drinks, right? So. I think it's, and, and ultimately, right, uh, I, I believe everybody's dreams, when we have the right data, we have the right technology being used the right way and uh, asking the right questions, 
we, we will ultimately, at some point in the future, have an individual relationship with your consumer, right? I don't need to know who you are, but I know your preferences. Uh, I, 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 through your actions, I can actually establish a unique connection with you, consumer, and not in a generic way, in a very, very intimate relationship with your consumer. Well, we, we did used to have a, a theory in, in Coca-Cola that it was all going to be about individual uh, marketing. And a lot of companies had this, uh, you know, this theory. And this will be true for some percentage of, uh, of, the, of the population, uh, because some people will opt in to, to very kind of specific relationships. We have a really cool freestyle app that allows you uh, to save uh, and, and do your own uh, mixes. Uh, you may remember as a kid doing this at the sort of, you know, the suicide, the suicide and mixing uh, everything uh, t together. Well, you can do that in, in an app now. And there are some people that do that. And, and, and we're building that functionality into the apps from uh, with our, our, our partners. Um, but the, the freestyle machines are all in a context. You know, they're in a, they, they, they sit in a, a place. Uh, that has its sort of unique demographic profile. Uh, it may um, uh, sit in a, a mall with particular types of shops around it uh, in a neighborhood that defines a, a particular demographic. And so that, that's data that's, that's useful uh, as we think about uh, the sort of personality of the machine uh, and uh, also data that's useful when we look at what gets poured uh, from, the, from the machine. Uh, and there's you know billions of pores every year, so it's a it's a it's a mountain of of useful data uh, that as as input. Uh, oh, you you asked about how we take feedback. Um, I think we take feedback like every other big company right now. I mean, we we pay a lot of attention to our our our, our channels uh, online, particularly Twitter, Facebook, and the and the rest. Uh, I would say most of the constructive feedback comes through the call center, though. There's a lot, uh, I mean, people get really, really passionate if they detect that the Coke that they've poured uh, does not meet our quality standards. Uh, we'll get calls, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and so that I, I would say that's probably, uh, for constructive feedback, uh, the most useful channel, although we, we listen um, to all of them. Uh, and uh, I know I tend to... I probably personally, when I'm giving feedback to a brand, I'm not going to name the airline uh, that, that I often give feedback to. Uh, but uh, I tend to get best results on, on Twitter, I, I find. Uh, and by the way, the flavor that, uh, that I mentioned, it was uh, the cherry Sprite, right? Yeah. So who would imagine that people would be mixing Sprite and the cherry uh, is, is cherry Coke or cherry flavor? What? Yeah, so well, that, that's interesting. Just part of Sprite's brand is it's a, uh, it's a clear beverage. Uh, and this is really, really important. And there are parts of the world where uh, a clear soft drink is, is sort of the only kind of soft drink, or the only category of soft drinks that will really sell. Uh, I learned uh, traveling to uh, a couple of countries in, in, in Asia, there was a strong preference for Sprite over Coca-Cola. Uh, because of the lack of color, because it was clear. Yeah. Um, and so that was part of uh, the brand. But when we, we, we discovered that there were a lot of people that really had a preference for Cherry Sprite. We learned this um, through, through data on the, on the freestyle machine. And so that wound up uh, in being, being bottled and probably wouldn't have uh, without that, uh, that happening in freestyle. Now, that was an accident. That, that was not a... Uh, I mean, we were deliberately making, of course, Sherry Sprite, but it was an accident that we discovered that. This was before we were really paying attention to this enormous uh, uh, asset uh, of data that was coming off, off the machines. Can you, can you say that, that there's an AI or some sort of algorithm looking at those combinations of flavors to kind of rank them for you guys? Are you at that point? Not yet? No. Not yet. We... we, we are going to, to do that for sure. Uh, we're, we're very interested in understanding the relationship between what happens on the freestyle machine and what happens in outlets to sell bottles and cans uh, around it. That is, I would say, nascent right now. We're just beginning to do that. Um, a place where we think there's a lot of low-hanging uh, fruit, as it were, on our, our bottom line uh, profitability uh, is in, in service and uh, uh, Connor has some stats on this. I'll let him run through. But one of the things that we know is that uh, when we send a truck out with a technician to fix the freestyle machine, 50% of the time it's, it's, not, it's not broken. 
You know, no parts are replaced. Uh, and so that's a very, very expensive um, problem at scale. Uh, and so we're beginning to use AI and machine learning against the uh, against understanding the reasons for that and driving uh, costs out of the system. Uh, we're also beginning to do it uh, to look at, at opportunities for for top line and introduction of new brands or flavors. And and, and we can talk if, if you want to yeah. talk about that. I think it's pretty it's pretty funny. interesting. Uh, people, you, um, a lot of times people associate machine learning with sexy scenarios, right? Finding new flavors. And sometimes the most effective cost-wise is the less sexy aspect of the machine that you can possibly think about is maintenance. Well, so. the, pump, the pumps are pretty sexy. <laughs> uh, but you, I'm you don't. I'm going to go down that road. But. but you definitely don't want to replace something that's not broken. It's very expensive. And then you, you haven't solved the problem, right? So uh, th those are really, really good, uh, uh, good opportunities for, for us to go after. Um, we think we're in the in in many ways uh, at the beginning. You know, we, we've had this machine in market for uh, for ten years, and we've um, you know grown it into this really important uh, business for Coca Cola, and um, we're going to continue to do that, and we're going to be smart about it. But we're also at the point we're at a scale where. Uh, it makes sense to to concentrate on driving some of the unnecessary cost out. That's a big part of uh, of what we uh, will be doing with uh, with AI. Yeah. I, I just think it's super important that we ask ourselves what are the real business problems that we're trying to solve instead mm -hmm. of yeah, okay, let's use a sexy technology to do something. Just let's take a step back and think about the most important problems for the business before we actually go Yeah, ahead. Connor and I were talking about this last night, and, and the first, pro I mean, I probably did this, I probably posed the problem, oh man, Connor, rolling all these trucks is really expensive. But that's a very vague kind of problem to go off and, and mm -hmm. solve with AI. Um, uh, and uh, when, as we've stepped down into the, it, you know, into the root causes, some of these are really, really simple. You know, some of them are like, this particular 10 technicians, um, you know, never seem to find the problem. And I, by the way, that's not their fault. I put that on, on us, but that's, you know, that's, you don't need AI for that, right? You need a, a table, maybe a graph. Uh, but then as you, as you start, you find some of these problems are not low hanging fruit anymore. Sure. Yeah, I've noticed that pretty much anytime anyone's doing any kind of analysis now, it's called AI, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? It's machine learning, it's almost like nauseating, right? Um, <laughs> And actually, it's bad because people will um, take a simple problem that could be done with the regression, and they'll start to throw AI scientists at it, which aren't cheap, by the way. Um, and so, our, at least my guidance is, anytime you have a problem, start with statistics. I mean, typically with regression, simple statistics, you can solve 90% of all problems. I think AI is great with solving problems that have a ton of data, and it's really difficult to solve traditionally with yeah. statistics. Yeah. Absolutely, but on the flip side, you have, if you really want to solve a complicated problem that you know it needs to use AI. There's a loads of preparation for that, and we, we touched about, about it a little bit. That's right. Uh, there's a question for you um, directly from the audience. Uh, you mentioned a brand which was in trouble. Uh, could you explain more in detail how you use the data to find and solve that problem? Yeah, so I mean, most of the data that, that we've used over time was just kind of internal data and uh, sales data. And so, um, so this was much more uh, exhaustive data science search. And so, so we were taking um, Nielsen data. Nielsen can gives you, uh, give you data from convenience stores, from, um, from grocery stores. You can look at basket level stuff and see what are people buying with that product. And so, um, so we got a huge amount of data from all these different partners and, and brought it together. We were basically just uh, able to get to the bottom of um, which demographics were affected. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were able to like, change messaging and things like that to kind of react to it. Um, but again, it, it was very, very, very expensive. Yeah, and, then, and we're not going to talk about the particular brand, but I can tell you it was certainly a high-profile brand. Uh, one of the things we found in the data what was absolutely surprising uh, was that um, uh, it affected, uh, although we had been looking at it very, very broadly, it was a relatively small number of, of zip codes that were affected by the, the fall-off in, in, in sales. We probably didn't need AI to find that particular part of the, mm -hmm. of, the, of the message either, although it did come out of the analysis. Yeah. The nice thing about the, all this is because anytime you have a company and there's a, a brand is affected, there's about 30 different people with an opinion about, um, this goes to any data problem, there's always 30 different opinions about why this 
this is so. Um, and senior leadership tend yeah. to have a little bit more, more pull um, because they're leaders. And so I think getting down to the data and getting at, down to exactly why it's happening, uh, it cuts through time and then, then you can make a, a better business decision. Otherwise it's speculation. This is what we think, it's conjecture and, it, and people spin. And so um, using this data we're able to, and you always find something very different than what you thought originally. That's a, that's a really great point. I, I think that's one of the most important things uh, that I've taken away from the last uh, couple of years in using uh, data and in, in analysis uh, is uh, data completely changes uh, the nature of the conversation. Any big company and, and hierarchy that people close to the top have the, the most influence. Uh, data uh, and facts are a great, a great leveler, and they're important for organizations that want to continue to learn. So we've, uh, we've certainly discovered that through these couple of examples. Uh, and uh, um, Do you guys think that you suffer at some point of data blindness, meaning you have all the data you wanted, but you cannot extract any insights? Or do you believe that you can always extract insights from data? You can always get it, it's just not how much cost. And we definitely don't cost. have all the data that we need. It's, it's still difficult. I mean, we have our, our system, Coca-Cola's got a huge system. Um, bottlers and distributors and, and globally. And so all the efforts that we had to establish the data lake, we still have a decent way to go. So mm -hmm. we don't have all the data that we need, but we have more data than I think uh, is easy to consume. Gosh, and, I don't think we're anywhere to run, running out of things to analyze. I think that would, that would be <laughs> profound lack of imagination. Uh, I think w w what's gonna be interesting uh, too is, uh, is, is how we go about that. In some ways, it's a, it's a sort of endless mountain of data to, an to analyze, mm -hmm. and it's always uh, getting bigger. I think uh, figuring out what, what business questions we wanna ask, uh, and then really going deep on those that, that lend themselves to AI analysis is gonna be the key. It's hard to build a da data practice internally too. I mean, companies are even struggling with where do, where do people go? Are the, are the scientists in the business? Are they in IT? They go into the business and um, not really sure that there's a career path uh, for them. And so um, that's been difficult too, just building that practice, again, back to the data strategy. And yeah, and uh, you think your job is to make those connections? To make the connections between the data science and business, like you, you at so, least in terms of awareness? Right. Well, one of the things I would say is that people tend to, because data science is technical, like let's yeah. go to the tech, technical people, and I, I worked in IT for years, but it, yeah. it can't be led from IT. Correct. It's got to be a, a, something that the business cares about and invests mm -hmm. in. It's got to be led by the business. I think IT can help, help do the execution, but mm -hmm. I think IT-led uh, data initiatives are, are, are probably not going to be successful. Yeah. So we talked about loads of data, but just to give a sense of the scale that we're talking about, right? So. You mentioned billions of pores every year, like billions, right? So who can give me a sense of? Yeah, so we have billions of pores every year. And also, um, it's one of the reasons I love working in this group is um, we design the boards, uh, we uh, design the pumps, we, um, we work with manufacturers. There's 2, 000, about 2,000 parts per machine, and we have ten, tens of thousands of machines. So literally, we're, uh, we're responsible for a billion parts. We don't sell the machines to customers. We actually lease them, so we fully own and are accountable for these machines. So if they break, we get, we get the phone call and we're accountable for mm -hmm. it. And so um, that means there's a, uh, a massive organization around fixing these things, right? And some of these things, um, I mean, they're around the world, but they're on cruise ships. So some of these things are, are not even in reliable, predictable locations. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of scale to it. And Tiziana mentioned that uh, sometimes you have to be looking on the edges of this ecosystem to s look for uh, money saving. Have you guys done already something using AI or whatnot to save money and improve the? Yeah, yeah. so the, the way that, when there's a problem in the machine, the way this typically goes is um, there's an issue, we get a call, um, and the person on the phone tries to help out, and then they'll, they'll dispatch a truck, right? And those trucks mm -hmm. are very expensive to get there. And so, um, so the way that we're approaching that now is there's no reason, uh, AI is very good at predictive analytics. So there's no reason we can't um, look at all the data on the machines and actually predict the failures or see the failures before the customers do. So if a customer calls, the, the right response is that uh, we see the issue um, and we've already dispatched a truck or, or maybe we've even fixed it remotely. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so predictive analytics is, is big. A part of that, again, is a lack of data. Um, the AI is so simple. I mean, honestly, putting together um, an AI model and, um, and turning out data is, is very straightforward. But 
you don't have, if you don't have the data, um, it's not gonna take you anywhere. So we've had to build all of um, reporting mechanisms all into the embedded systems uh, to surface the data up and put it into the cloud. We put that in, um, in Amazon Redshift. Gotcha. So that's a great, that's a great point. There's the, the, the wrangling of the data up front. There's the figuring out what your business problems you wanna to ask. And then the third stage of this, and for those of you that work in large organizations, you'll probably appreciate this, is, is so what? How do you operationalize that it, it, it comes out of this? So we, we can do this predictive analytics, but we don't have uh, a mechanism, a simple mechanism today to, uh, to pre-roll a truck based on a statistical probability, mm -hmm. uh, which is really what we're talking about here. The, if, the, if the pump has failed and you can no longer get um, any, any lime flavored drinks, uh, that's a, a problem and definitely you dispatch a truck to, to fix. But what if you just have a 80% probability that the pump is gonna fail in the next three months? Do you dispatch the truck? And so there's a, there's a whole uh, bit of operational work that, that goes on and some, some analysis. Maybe you're likely to, based on the number of, of fixes you have in a year, maybe you're likely to be rolling a truck anyway in the next, say, X months. And if that's the case, then 80% probability is you probably go ahead and on that service fix the, the pump that's likely to fail. So this is, um, this is all work that's going on right now, uh, but it's, it's a kind of really cool uh, and interesting uh, problem. You have the data this end, you have the, the analysis in the middle, but then you have how do you operationalize it uh, to gain you know, most efficiency and, and, and most value on the bottom line. There's another use case which I think is um, applicable for all businesses, and that's customer churn. And it's, it's, it's really easy to take a look at um, your sales, um, service calls, um, all the data you have about a customer, and then predict customer churn. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those AI models um, exist already, so it's easy to put that together. And A, B I'm, tests or something. I mean, if you, if you can predict customer churn and cut down um, churn by 3 or 4%, for a company like Coca-Cola, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. And it's easy to do. Very cool. So it's funny to see that on Slido, questions switched to the human experience, which is, I think, the part of the segment that we wanted to dive a little bit more. So customers and experimentation, yeah. right? So can you give us an insight on how you're bringing the humans in the loop? Like, you have loads of data already, but how you bring, like, experimentation to closer to the people? Yeah, so one of the things that, uh, in, the, in the realm of what's sexy and not sexy, we're, we're totally rebuilding uh, the operating system that, uh, that sits on all of our, our fleet, and there are, are four distinct freestyle uh, machines in the marketplace now, and we are doing uh, continuous innovation. But we're on sort of multiple platforms. Multiple platforms, um, from a software perspective, makes it really, really hard to, to innovate, because you have to do everything two or three times. So we're, we're doing that, and we're, I, I mentioned the iPhone earlier. You may remember when the iPhone came out, you had, the, I don't know, a calculator and a calendar app, and maybe there was weather and stock market. These were pre-canned apps uh, from Apple, and, and in some ways we think of, about the freestyle machine this way. What you can do on a freestyle machine is there's a consumer user interface, and there's a non-consumer user interface, and that's it. Uh, anything that we do on behalf of a customer, or we recently did a partnership with the U.S. Olympic team, uh, that is a lot of work and a lot of lead time, uh, six to nine months, because it's fundamental. Uh, it, 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 you're touching the, the, the content management system, and uh, which, which, by the way, sends content as well as recipes for drinks, and you're touching, or you're touching the core operating system. Uh, that's not a great thing to do when what you really want to make sure is that your machine fundamentally operates and pours drinks. Uh, and so it's a break on innovation. So we're uh, in the Connor's team leading um, a freestyle OS that will go across all of the dispensers. Uh, and, and one of the things that we're really excited about is uh, containerization, which is a sort of technical term for apps uh, that will allow us to really shorten the innovation cycle and do a lot of experimentation, including A-B tests, but also including tie-ins with our, our partners whether they be cinema chains and, and, and tie-ins with films or other things. Uh, I don't expect that uh, there are a lot of, it's not like uh, uh, you know, somebody is gonna go in a shop and download a bunch of random apps for the machines. It's not about that from an, you know, the comparison to the iPhone. But the containerization is the, is, is the big deal. It means we can really run short 
sweet innovation cycle. Yeah, and the, and the goal is to allow other people to, I mean, if, because before any, every innovation came through my team and we have limited time and resources. So, so Apple, Facebook, um, Salesforce, everyone has opened up an app store mm -hmm. model to, right, um, to create some kind of scale. The issue with the machine is that there's safety and regulatory issues. Um, and so you have to kind of try to figure out uh, how to deal with that. And it's back, it's back to uh, containerization and then also testing. Um, if somebody comes in and, and submits something, we have to do uh, 12 weeks of user testing in order to make sure that it's safe and doesn't compromise uh, beverage quality and things like that. It's, it's a non-starter. So a, a lot of what we've been um, uh, doing is uh, fully automating everything. I think that's kind of table stakes today. Um, and even using, um, working towards robotics to, to test machines because it's a physical thing. You have to open doors, pull cartridges, and things like that. Does that uh, accelerate? Have you tried that already? And is, is it accelerating the process of testing it? Yeah, it used to take us 12 weeks, and now we're down to two weeks. And I think the robotics will take us hopefully down, under, down to under a day. So um, if you can't turn stuff around in hours or days, then innovation, I, I think, is impossible. Well, also, with a, with, with a container, too, you can keep... <coughs> Uh, you can keep an app away from the, the, the sharp objects, right? I, I mean, there, you know, there are a number of bad things that you could do with a software bug. Uh, there is a, a bug uh, that I'll admit we introduced. It only happened in the lab because we caught it, but it's known as jackpotting the machine. If you ever go to a casino and you get the handle and all that comes out are quarters all the time. I imagine all of our ingredients coming out of the machine all the time. <laughs> it's kind of messy and hard to clean up. Uh, so we can keep an app away from the possibility of, of doing something like that, uh, because frankly, most of what uh, you know, an app needs, you can, you can imagine, and by the way, I, this is not an announcement, and we're not doing a tie-in as far as I know with Ready Player One or anything like that, but you can imagine um, turning a freestyle machine into, um, you know, ba based on your beverage selection into a, a, an arcade uh, game. Uh, for 30 seconds that you could play, you know, across the six that are sitting in the cinema. I mean, you mentioned some really, really cool stuff. Um, I've actually seen asteroids on one of our machines in the lab. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it is, uh, it's possible to do that sort of thing with, uh, with short cycle time innovation. Uh, and it's not if you have to go through uh, 12 weeks of, of QA just to make asteroids run. And, in, and uh, if you guys succeed in the, um, in transforming the freestyle machine in that way, you actually, what you have is a, a experimentation <laughs> platform for the entire Coke system, for any brand to actually pay, play around with an experimentation platform, which by the way is gonna collect rich data that's gonna be fed back into the loop, and, and this is um, absolutely priceless for the, the Coca-Cola ecosystem as a whole. It is, how, how many of you have gotten Tide Pods in the mail? Uh, anybody gotten Tide Pods in the mail? <laughs> you, you, you know, don't eat them. Um, <laughs> they're, they're not edible, but uh, the reason you get Tide Pods in the mail is because sampling is one of the oldest um, uh, is it, uh, tricks, I guess, in the book for any kind of consumer brand. If someone tries your product three times is a massively statistical significant thing that happens uh, on the curve. And so for, for Coca-Cola Freestyle is the, sort of the ultimate sampling program. We can introduce new brands um, uh, and, and flavors and in fact whole categories uh, to, uh, uh, to the system through the Freestyle machine uh, and learn um, uh, what, what consumers uh, like. And we can experiment with messaging um, on the screen uh, a, a, along with that. So we, we are, um, in the last couple of years, we've been doing that uh, with, um, with different mixes and, and learning about uh, consumers. But I, I think that's nascent. Again, I, I think there's nothing but uh, interesting stuff to be done in that area. Uh, we, we've only just scratched the surface of that. I'm looking forward to see it and drink it. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to be able to push. Um, if you think how long it takes to develop a new brand, um, and the bottling and the packaging and the shipping and logistical exercise there. Um, it's nice to be able to, so we use Adobe AEM for content. We can build a new recipe and a new um, imagery and push it down in hours. Yeah, you, can, you can actually uh, uh, have a cycle of experimentation of weeks playing around different recipes and how people react in different places. It's like the, the possibilities are infinite. I got excited just thinking about how fast we could test so many things and collect data and mm -hmm. actually have a complete loop yeah. that's very, very agile. Well, it could be minutes, although we, we do, before we allow any kind of flavor combination to go out, we, we 
test drink. it, or, you know, make sure it tastes good. <laughs> uh, but I, you, yeah, it can be very, very fast. That's that's right. And uh, and, and honestly, that's that's key those days. Right? You gotta yeah. move fast. If you have a experimentation platform this powerful with that amount yeah. of data being collected. What we've hinted at, and I don't think we've been as, as clear, is that we're, it's because we're making the drinks in real time, we're mixing ingredients in real time. Uh, and because of that, uh, although we have 170 that you can get on the screen, there's really an infinite number that can be created out of, out of the ingredients that are in machine. Uh, and so that is uh, what, we've, what we've managed to do because we can push recipes down via CMS that make any kind of use or combination or order of any of those ingredients that we've got some intersection between the, uh, the digital and the real that is really, really cool. Yeah. And how far are you from making some assumptions, push a new flavor to certain demographics, for instance, airports, right? And then collect that data and say, hey, this flavor is is really great. The Diet Coke, we recently pushed a new uh, new flavor for Diet Coke. Really? Oh, yeah. there's a very interesting question from Anonymous, very smart person. Uh, <laughs> did freestyle play a role in the Diet Coke, new Diet Coke flavors? I, I don't know. Uh, it did, I, as far as I know, it did not. Yeah. Uh, freestyle did not play a role in that, although freestyle is playing a role in, in, in putting them into the into the market. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a, I, don't, I wouldn't call that a missed opportunity, but I think we're going to see a lot uh, a, a lot more of that, and a lot of testing before we do, you know, sort of big yeah. uh, launches on on flavor combinations, because we have this ability to put yeah. ingredients uh, together and to and to make new combinations. And you guys talked about speed in the, the long cycles of in, envisioning a new product, putting it in the market. Have you guys progressed in that term? Do you agree, first of all, that you know, without speed, you are a danger? Yes, we have. I, it, we were. A couple of years ago, the, the cycle time for introducing uh, any kind of new brand or flavor was uh, probably around uh, 12 months. And, uh, and that bec that's because everything uh, required uh, effectively like a firmware update. Uh, that's not true anymore. We can now push uh, these uh, recipes down in experiments digitally. So. We probably are on about a three-month cycle time. I think that will come down uh, uh, two weeks um, in, uh, over the next uh, year, but that re that requires us to do some, you know, some boring stuff like you know, up update the operating system and introduce containerization and all, all those sorts of things that are really foundational uh, to those fast uh, cycle times and experiments. Yeah. So I'll I'll touch back on the human factor. So I. I've known Coca-Cola as one of the brands that is really very good at promoting those emotional connections, right? Just think about the Hilltop commercial all the way uh, to the World Cup last, last time or uh, the, the polar bears, I love them, right? So how do you think AI will help you guys to bring that human factor, the feelings, like create this, those emotional connections? I know it's a very blurry question, but no, are you guys very, thinking about it? Yeah. We're thinking about it. I think some of it, though, is just the, 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 the machine understanding its environment a, a bit better. Today, uh, when you walk up to the machine, uh, and again, this is, uh, the, most of the machines are 10 years old. They don't sense uh, presence. Uh, and in fact, if you're taking a long time to select your drink, it will ask you if you're still there. Well, <laughs> sensing human presence within a couple of feet is very, very trivial uh, technology. So we're, we're innovating all the time on, um, on the, the hardware part of the, of, of the machine as well as the software. So some of this is really low-hanging fruit uh, from an innovation perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to do at scale when you already have tens of thousands of machines out there, but we're paying a lot of attention to that because some of, uh, some of the surprise and delight from using Freestyle has all these choices. Another is, uh, you know, when you pick up your iPhone and it recognizes that you've picked it up and unlocks itself, there's some there's a, a connection made. Uh, and so some of what we need to do is very, very basic, and, uh, and we'll do that with sensors. Um, as far as AI on uh, emotions, I, I'm not thinking about it exactly in those terms. I'm thinking about it more, um, we're going to um, continuously test and learn using methods that are 
not at all science fiction and are going to create data sets that we can analyze uh, using AI techniques. Uh, but it's it's A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, rinse and repeat. You know, setting up experiments, uh, gathering data, learning from the experiments, analyzing, and rinse and repeat. So we're, we're going to do a, a lot more of that. Uh, and the key we, we, we'll come back to is shortening the, the cycle time. And I, I know maybe you don't want to reveal that, but do you guys plan to open up the platform to for brands, since you mentioned containerization and the ability to push new applications, you kind of have the control that the application coming is not going to disrupt the machine, but are you planning to bring brands and give them this space, right? When you are in front of the customer, I know it's Coca-Cola, but there's still sure. some sort of brand that I love there with you guys. Is, is that in, on the time frame? Well, one of the challenges you have to address is if everyone walks up to a vending machine in a different place and it looks mm -hmm. different, Different, yeah. it's a problem, it's a usability issue, right? So yeah. you, we have to figure out how do we, how do, we do testing and A-B testing without making people crazy. What, what was that recent uh, user interface chat? Uh, was it Snapchat? Yeah. yeah. Yes. You know, I think everyone, I mean, maybe it's a better user experience, but I think people went crazy because um, it, just, it just didn't operate the way that they uh, were used to. So I think we have to balance, balance that and then the, the quality and safety yeah. stuff. Um, so again, back to the Docker containerization, which is the technique that cloud companies use to um, to contain different apps from different customers, it, some tech, technical things like that we have to work on. Yeah, but we, but I mean, the short answer is, for sure, in internal brands, and we already do some of this, but the cycle times are long, so we'll continue doing that with much shorter cycle times, uh, and allow brands internally to use FreeStyle. And I think we'll we already do a little bit of this with partners, but I think we'll do a lot more, or we'll have the ability anyway to do a lot more of this. Uh, with our partners, which are you know malls and food service outlets and, and mm -hmm. cinema chains, uh, because we'll have uh, an SDK and a developer kit that will allow uh, them to write uh, uh, Docker apps that will go through an approval process, but then, then can be become part of the personnel of the machine. Again, that's very very nascent right now. We do that with custom beverages for some of our our customers and some of our partners like the Olympics. Um, and we'll, we'll we'll see a lot more of uh, of, of that. Because it, it works really well. In the, do the, does the freestyle is, um, is declaring the, the end of the old dispensers? Like, well, what happens with this? Like, we look at an old dispenser today, it's the same as 1980-something, right? So well, no, I don't think we're declaring. We're definitely not declaring the, old, the, the end of the old dispensers. I mean, the, uh, it will be a long, long time before anything like that happens, partly because uh, freestyle works um, in a place, frankly, that sells a lot of uh, a, a lot of beverages, uh, because we, uh, if we put it into um, uh, an outlet today that did not uh, have a lot of foot traffic or, or sell a lot of beverages, ingredients would go bad. There's just some fundamental economics or freestyle. It is a it's a premium offering, and it will be a premium offering for some time. So, yeah. don't see it as the as as the as the end. Although we are introducing, or we have introduced. Uh, uh, machines that are for sort of mid-traffic outlets, they're countertop mm -hmm. machines. Uh, and so we'll probably see some more innovation in that, in that direction. Mm -hmm. So CINT is doing uh, some work with uh, another company. Uh, they, are, they migrated from building compressors for the fridges, fridges uh, and became some sort of data company. They saw the opportunity, right? I'm, we're there inside fridges everywhere. Why not try to collect data? So can you can you tell us a little bit more of that? Yeah. And I want to see uh, to to learn if Coca Cola is planning to do something. Similar. Yeah, they did. Um, they did develop a special sensor for the, their fridges, and and they partnered with us to get information on temperature, uh, electricity consumption, geolocation, helping them manage the, the fridge themselves, um, um, crossing that information with point of sales um, um, information to help them manage restocking. Um, so uh, the idea is to um, slowly collect more and more data, cross the data from the fridge, from the data with the point of sales, weather, uh, detect trends, and help them to, mm. to be prepared for uh, the trends in consumption, uh, reducing, um, as you guys uh, are concerned about, reducing uh, maintenance costs on those fridges. So not far from uh, some of the things that you guys are already looking at uh, and planning uh, for the future, right? There's an interesting thing happening, I, I think, with, with AI. It, it used to be that, like, I'll take a security example. 
um, it, it used to be that people would look at all the security data and make decisions about what was happening, right? And now what we're starting to see is um, uh, in the cloud environment that we have, there's a billion security events coming out per day. So instead of people using computers to aid them in their, in their work, all of a sudden we're starting to see uh, the machines are taking on the responsibility of doing the analysis. And then they're asking humans to help them. So it's, mm. com it's com basically human-aided um, computing ins instead of a computer-aided. Uh, um, and so I think that there's like kind of a culture shift there. I think um, marketers will do less uh, analysis. Um, I think people will spend more time you know, like customer-facing and things like that. There's a, I think there's a culture shift in terms of people that traditionally looked at this kind of data. Um, there's an inversion of control, right? I think the machines start to take a little bit more of ownership of analytics. And there is uh, that discussion that we had the other day about trust, right? How, how, how can we make humans uh, feel comfortable enough with this kind of uh, shift in the mindset? Uh, mm -hmm. how, how can we establish a trust relationship, trust-based relationship in which people actually feel comfortable with this inversion of roles, right? right so it's interesting. It's not so the way AI works, um, I think, like the two sides of your brain, right? You have your left brain and your right brain, right? Um, and your left brain is more that analytical, the voice in your head. It's like, yes, I agree with what this person's saying, and things like that. Um, and then your right brain is that more creative, intuitive side of your brain, right? And it'll say things like, "Hey, this is situation seems dangerous," or "This is the college I want to go to," but it doesn't really tell you why, right? You you just kind of trust people trust your um, intuition, right? And AI actually works the same way. So an AI neural net, uh, you feed it data and it spits out answers. And there's actually no way to know how it got there. Like the picture of the cat example, right? You give it a picture, all the picture is is really three million numbers, right? And it spits out a description, cat sitting in a windowsill. Yeah. Um, and so there's a, that's a little scary for a lot of people. I think it's scary for pretty much everybody. The best um, example in literature has to be the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the computer spits out. Does anybody know the number? Yeah. 42. <laughs> 42. How, how did you arrive at this number? Well, it's going to take more analysis. This is sort of the yeah. truth of AI right now. It's a you, great yeah. you can't see inside the brain. Yeah, and I think there's some company, uh, countries, I, I believe Germany was working on legislation where they said, if you're making decisions like, should this person get health care or not, uh, the AI would have to spit out an answer, but also give you some information on how it actually got to that answer. Mm -hmm. um, but that's fundamentally different from how the technology works. So I, don't, I don't really know how we reconcile that. Um, but, but one approach I think you can take to kind of mitigate that in the meantime. Let, let's take the customer churn example, right? So you're trying to figure out what is the likelihood of this customer uh, turning over? Um, and if you can identify that person, you send in the SWAT team, right, and, and you save them. And yeah. so the, the way that you do it is um, take years of, a year's worth of data and throw out the last three months, and you train the neural net on, on, the, on the first nine months of data. And then from there, um, you, f you feed in the last three months, so you know those customers, you know whether they churned or not, you feed that into the neural network. Um, and you ask it whether these customers will churn or not. And you compare it to reality, right? Because you know what the reality is. And, um, and so that'll tell you whether the AI is actually accurate or not. And if it's not, then you have to start from scratch. And if it is, um, then you can say, OK, we think this provides some value to our business. Um, but, but that's really what AI is right now. It's, it's a series of inputs and outputs. And there's really no way to ask it how it got there. It's, it's fundamentally different from the way we've always worked. Yeah, well, we, I think at some point we're going to have to, to uh, find a way to establish a connection between this kind of input output without a, a clear path mm -hmm. see a decision making path and the end user experience right how, how do you make sure that everybody that's consuming the output is comfortable with the entire process um, we may not be there yet but uh, we will pretty soon even in the dispensers we're gonna pretty soon have to reconcile this unknown with the comfortable experience for the end user. Well, you have to ask the, the, the sort of business question and get aligned on the business question. And then uh, the, the how you get there matters for sure. But let's say we decide to run an A-B test on uh, two or three or four or 10 different designs of the user interface uh, for service technicians. Uh, and fundamentally, we want to have service technicians have higher quality service calls uh, and be faster. Well, we can all disagree on the design, uh, but if the, if, the, if the rules of the game are set up right and the rules of the game are higher quality service in less time, uh, then it doesn't matter whether I like the AI or whether we paint it purple and, and it's, yeah. you know, I, I, it doesn't matter. You know, at that point, it becomes about the data. Yeah. And um, so setting those rules up and, and, and asking those questions in advance is really important. 
And frankly, we all learn this, anybody that studied any of this for any time, all learn this from watching uh, Google not change their search page. Yep. And the reason Google didn't change their search page is every time they ran an experiment on you know, putting the weather on or whatever it, it was, they found out that it took people longer uh, and, uh, and they had a, a less happy experience with the search page. Mm -hmm. And so that's how you, uh, that's kind of the classical now way. It's funny to be talking about that because it's, it's 20 years old now, this idea. Mm -hmm. But this is still how everybody with any sense does it. You set up these experimental parameters in advance. You decide what you're going to measure. You state it, and then you measure it, and you go with with where the data takes you. Uh, so that's what we're going to that's what we're going to do. Uh, you know that data and results ends a lot of arguments. It's like uh, in, in agile world, working code ends a lot of arguments. Uh, same is true with uh, design and A/B tests. You know, listen so, to the data. No. One last question before everyone leaves the room. Guys, stay, please. Um, so you mentioned 10 years, right? T 10 years of business. Like, and I'm pretty sure you wasn't making a lot of money since the beginning, right? So you were experimenting with the machines and rolling out gradually. Uh, that's something that we see a lot, like uh, new ideas that are great, that are, there's a group, the enthusiasts that are trying to push it, and then the CFO kills it because it's not making money. It's the second year. So how do you... How do you guys protect that? I know now it's probably a billion dollar business, right? You mentioned billions of pores, easy math, right? It's a big business. Big business for Coca-Cola. So how, in your opinion, how, what was the secret sauce to keep this project going? And uh, it, stealth and, and, uh, and belief from the board and the, and the chairman that, uh, that we had to innovate. Uh, it was a dedication to innovation. There are lots of models for this. Uh, the first, though, is if you're not spending any money on sustained year-on-year -year innovation, you have totally lost the plot, uh, and some other companies are going to come get your business. Yeah. And uh, I think it's that that belief ultimately. I mean, the other stuff is easy. Find, you know, find your best people that understand your business, uh, and put them on sustained innovation. And we, so we did. We locked. I mean, we didn't. We did let them out for sandwiches and cocktails, but. We did. We we locked them in the basement, not literally, but we we kept. We had this group of, of uh, the beginning of six engineers uh, that were uh, in um, you know a sort of secret location under the building and did the sustained innovation, uh, and that was the that was the key. We're a much larger larger team now, uh, but when we look at um, at this to some degree, you, you have to challenge the CFO with this uh, idea that. Um, that this is a, a, a world that is changing and consumer tastes are changing very, very rapidly, yeah. uh, and nobody gets a free pass. Uh, so you have to be good at innovation, and you have to spend money on it, and that's, too, where you have to put your top talent. If you're not doing those, those three things, you're not innovating. Perfect. So thank you so much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed it. We enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>